Much of the credit for connecting the dots that took the Watergate break-in all the way to the White House goes to two young Washington Post reporters. Of course, we're talking about none other than Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, whose books, The Final Days and All the President's Men, are being reissued by Simon & Schuster, part of the CBS Corporation. The two were played quite famously by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman in the film adaptation of the classic, All the President's Men. And uh, disclosure here, Redford and Dustin Hoffman were not available, so we have Bernstein and Woodward. Stuck with us. <laughs> Two of my oldest friends here in Washington. Gentlemen, thank you so much. You know, I got to say, and I think a lot of people in Washington felt this way, I think one reason it took a while for people to figure out that this was really serious, it seemed so stupid. Uh, the president was ahead, breaking into the water gate. I mean, whoever broke into a campaign headquarters, that's where they keep the yard signs and stuff. There are no, there are no secrets there, but yet they did. When did the two of you understand uh, that this was really something of significance? Surprisingly early, uh, we had learned there was a secret fund of about $800,000 that paid for the bugging at Watergate and other illegal undercover activities against Nixon's political enemies. And we wrote that uh, John Mitchell, Nixon's law partner and attorney general, controlled those funds. And on that occasion, Wood Woodward and I were meeting in a vending machine room off the newsroom to say what we were going to say to the editors. And I felt a chill literally go down my back. And I said to Woodward, this president is going to be impeached. And Woodward said to me, oh, my God, you're right. And if we, we can never use that word impeach at the Washington Post, lest somebody think that we have an agenda. And we never did. But it was about 10 weeks in. You know, I, I thought it was interesting, and we, we've talked about this before, because it always comes up. People say, well, when you come right down to it, the cover-up was worse than the crime. You never bought into that. And in the uh, afterward of the uh, new reissue of, uh, of your books, you talk about that, Bob. Yes, and, and, and what if, the fact is that Watergate started before Watergate. Uh, that back in 1970, two years before the Watergate burglary, Nixon launched a series of secret undercover activities, rep, uh, tapping the telephones of rep, 17 reporters, White House aides, the secret Houston plan, as it uh, came to be known, uh, just very directly saying we're going to break the law, we're going to use illegal means uh, to go after the anti-war movement and the people who were his opponents. And so what, what happened here is uh, Nick's, and, and Carl and I have spent a lot of time looking at tape transcripts and listening to these tapes and so forth, and you see the real Nixon come out, which is uh, kind of the dog that never barks on the tapes. Nixon never says, what's good for the country? What do we need? It was always about Nixon, and it was using the presidency as an instrument of personal revenge in a horrendous way. Those tapes uh, are staggering to listen to, and there are new ones coming out this season, and you, you hear Nixon saying things like, oh yeah, I said use any means necessary, including illegal means. I can never admit to that, and of course he did on his secret well, tape. You know, uh, uh, one part of these new tapes that we're, we're now hearing, uh, we heard in the old tapes uh, Nixon making statements that were just blatantly racist. There's no question about that. But he, in these new tapes, it, it removes all doubt. I mean, he, he said things that I can't imagine anyone of, of any education, most people who are prejudiced, as, as we know, uh, it's based on ignorance. Nixon was an educated man. His mother was this quiet Quaker, and yet he literally seemed to hate Jews more than most of all amongst the other minorities. When we were writing The Final Days, we started to encounter this, and it's in The Final Days, and person after person would tell us about how he railed against Jews and about blacks. Uh, and finally, Arthur Burns, the ears, patrician uh, economic advisor to the president, said to me while we were reporting, 
uh, on the final days. Nixon had epithets for whole sections of mankind. There was an anger. It's possible to have real empathy for Richard Nixon. You see what we did at the beginning of the broadcast and this man who all his life wanted to be president of the United States. Uh, but with the empathy, you have to also recognize the criminal, criminal, criminality from the beginning of the presidency to the end of the presidency and this vengeance and this hatred, which he talks about in his final address. I, I mean, in that address, you know, where he was sweating, he had his wife, two daughters, two son-in-laws there, and there's a moment right at the end where he kind of waves his hand as if he s is going to say, uh, I, I called you here for a reason, and that reason is I have an understanding. I know what this was all about. And then in the, one of the most fabulous lines of the American presidency, he says, always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them, and then you destroy yourself. This was the piston of the Nixon administration, hate. And, uh, you know, where well, did it... Where did it come from? Uh, you know, a friend of mine said to me the other day, <clears throat> you know, he ran against John Kennedy in 1960. Uh, if he had won that race, would it have been the same kind of Nixon presidency? Uh, I don't know if I know the answer to that question, but I, I do wonder, did some of this paranoia come out of that experience? Well, it's, it's if history, but I find something really interesting as follows, the Hiss case. That on the tapes, time after time, we hear Nixon going after his enemies saying, they hate me since the Hiss case, Alger Hiss, the accused spy uh, in the 1950s whom Nixon pursued, and there was a great movement uh, that proclaimed Hiss's innocence. Uh, and Nixon was you know, regarded because of what he did in his as a smearer, as a, a terrible person. Well, it turns out Nixon was right about his. We know this from the so-called Venona uh, papers uh, of the Soviets. Uh, his was a spy. And this festering thing with Nixon, you hear it over and over on the tapes. But look, it's going to take an awful lot of psychobiography to finally solve the riddle of, of Richard Nixon, because this goes back to basic character, his life, uh, and we see it manifested as a whole, and as Bob says, the piston of his presidency. Yeah, and, and then also if you look, he, w he was vice president for Eisenhower for eight years, and there's some marvelous reporting that's been done on this, which shows that Nixon was snubbed by, Nick, uh, by Eisenhower, that Eisenhower never brought him in. And, and Nixon felt that uh, America was filled with a series of clubs that he could never get into. <laughs> and it, 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 it just burned him. And if, again, it's on the tapes. He'll, he'll say things like, oh, you know, all those, I, he joined, after he left the vice presidency and, and lost the governor's race uh, in 62, he went to practice law on Wall Street. And he says on the tapes with this kind of seething bitterness, you know, any of those lawyers ever ask me to their country clubs? And ask me to go out and play golf with them, not a one. And it, and it burned, and it, and it was a rage. And so when he won the presidency and then had to run again in 72, he felt he was entitled. He, and if, if there's, me, you know, go. Uh, what do you think would have happened if he told H.R. Haldeman, before we knew there was a taping system, he told him, I want to get rid of those tapes. And, and Haldeman said, sure. And then he went back to him and said, I want to do this. And again, Haldeman said, sure. I guess the question I have, what would have happened if they had burned the tapes or done something with them? And the question that I find interesting, why didn't Haldeman carry out this order? We know he did a lot, some things that were a lot worse than that. We don't know why he didn't. Uh, one thing is that uh, there was a belief by Nixon and Haldeman uh, that the tapes selectively used would help their defense, uh, particularly against John Dean, mm -hmm. uh, and that they could selectively use the tapes before the special prosecutor and investigators uh, to prove supposedly their innocence. But what is on those tapes and why the, you know, the question of, of, of burning them, 
Uh, had they burned them, what we know now is that very likely Nixon might have been able to stay in office. Because, you really think so? Well, it's if history, and if history never works. Yeah. But what we do know is that they kept coming back to the smoking gun. They needed a smoking gun. They needed to show a violation specific of the law. And that was done by the tapes. At the same time, there was this whole huge criminality that was ignored while looking for the smoking gun. So but it always got survived. down to, to the politics. In the politics of Washington uh, that summer, uh, uh, 40 years ago, was that the Republican Party turned on Nixon, best measured by Barry Goldwater, kind of the conscience of the party. And he and a group of Republicans went to see Nixon in the White House. Uh, day before he said he was going to resign, and Nixon kind of joked with him and said, well, Barry, how many votes if I'm impeached and there's a trial in the Senate? Well, I have about 20 votes. And Goldwater said, you'll have four and not mine. And that realization, and, and if you look at it uh, from some perspective, courage on the part of the Republican Party to say, as Goldwater said to us one night uh, in his apartment here in Washington, it's simple, too many crimes, too many lies. Bob, do you think this could happen again? Could another president get himself involved in something like this? And I guess part of the question I ask, what advice would you give to people who find themselves behind those iron gates where the public can be kept out, where only the people you see are the ones you want to see? Uh, what can what can I, they do I, I to mean, immunize this, themselves? You know, from something I, I, we're, like that? we're not good at, uh, at advice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but um, it was seven years ago. I went over to uh, do what turned out to be the last interview with Bob McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense for Kennedy and Johnson, Mr. Vietnam, and who apologized for Vietnam and. It was three hours, and he had an apartment in the Watergate, and it kept pressing McNamara, you know, squeeze out what's the final lesson of the mistake of Vietnam. And he said there's one lesson, and that is the advisors to the president need to sit around with the president and argue with him and say, wait a minute, let's look at all the options. Uh, you have to create a conflict situation. And he said what happens in the presidency is no one wants to argue with the president, particularly in front of other advisors. So the president gets isolated and lives in a bubble. And I think you can argue that happens to every president, including this one. Well, I want to thank both of you. <laughs> it's a subject that we could talk about all afternoon. Well, I want to thank you, and uh, we'll be right back with a little news analysis on some of the news of the day.